Okay, we're going to begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this gift of life that we share today, the gift of this day, the gift of your presence in our world and in our own persons. We thank you for continuing, continuing to reveal yourself to us and to speak your word in our midst. And we thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon the scriptures and to grow in our understanding and our love of Jesus through these words. We ask you to be with us today and help us to reflect honestly and carefully and lovingly upon this word in which we are uh, strengthened and nourished. And so, Lord, we bless you and we thank you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, we have a gospel today from the Gospel of Luke, and it's chapter 9, and I want to know why. Why are we, why are we looking at this gospel in chapter 9? Because you told us to. Besides that. <laughs> It's a feast or something, isn't it? What? Is there a feast on Sunday? Is there a feast on Sunday? It's the something. No, this coming Sunday. Corpus Christi. Oh, there's a feast. Could that be why we have this particular gospel? Oh, okay. So... One of the things to remember is that if we have gospel accounts that correspond to the feast day, we will follow the gospel of the year. So the gospel of the year is Luke, and so we're looking at Luke's account of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Now, it's really important to understand that this gospel about the multiplication of loaves and fish has something to do with the Eucharist, okay? And so that's why it's given to us as a part of the set of readings that we have for this week. So we've got to understand, first of all, when we read this story, we're reading a story that has a Eucharistic flavor to it, a Eucharistic meaning to it. And we're going to look at that carefully and see what, what is it about this story that brings out something um, pertaining, to the Euch pertaining to the Eucharist, because it's not obvious. It's not obvious, except we're talking about food, you know? All right, so let's read through chapter 9, verse 14. No, verse um, 11. Okay. Jesus welcomed those who were following him, and he spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and he cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the villages and the country round about to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a lonely place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. He said to his disciples, make them sit down in companies, about 50 each. And they did so and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were satisfied. And they took up what was left over, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Okay. Any questions after that first reading? We're good. Okay. What I want to, to, uh, to inform you of is at this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus is grooming his disciples 
to become his followers, to become, you know, more intentional in their discipleship. And so this story of the loaves and fish, although it has Eucharistic references, and we'll look at those more carefully, also has instructional pieces for how to be a good disciple, okay? So it's a story, this loaves and fishes, that helps us understand what is Jesus looking for in discipleship and what is he asking of his followers? So what I want you to do is at your table, I want you to talk about this gospel in relationship to discipleship. What is it telling us about discipleship and how to be a good disciple? So again, take some time to read it at your group, at your table, um, and then to have a conversation about discipleship and how this gospel gives you um, an image of discipleship. Good? Clear? Kind of. Kind of? Come on. Give me a break. Exactly. Exactly. 
a question. <laughs> I would be fearful. I would be doubtful that my efforts were adequate. So I might be doubtful that I'm going to get to I am actually way back to I had a crazy friend who was crazy when he got part of the It was an ex con, old bug boxer, big part of the city. And I went with him down to Carolina Beach with this group of party and converting people and I'd never done that before. Yeah, talk to you got quiet over here. here. What's going on? I saw the I had that experience. You're moving on to other things. So you saw deception, some people aren't. The origins of what it is. It's nothing to do with us. The origins of the Lord is very simple. The Pope so are you a disciple? <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I think oh, I, I try to be. I try to be at that. So, yeah, I realize that it's fish and bread. Are you a disciple? Yes. Yes. Are you? Yes. Yes. No, I, yeah, but I, you know, sometimes I think I'm more effective than those efforts that others are. Well, yeah. Oh, there's been a lot of stories. For sure. Yeah. And it is kind of terrifying that, you know, I was raised in a conservative Baptist where we were really taught that we needed to go every day and knock on something that strangers would and start, you know, telling them that you are going to hell and it changed. Um, and now I don't like that. I did my I did my church service. I'm a baby button Catholic. I was born in a Catholic church. I went to Catholic school until I had the seventh grade. But I found in my college years as a young adult that I was out here. Actually, Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, non-denominational. Of course, I didn't go to the Mormon church. I don't consider them Christians. I don't know. Anyways, still, yes. But anyways, uh, uh, it was eye opening. But here I am moving back to my home, moving right with the best of the kids. I encourage you all. I'll be having fun. Okay, let's have a conversation together. What do you think? What are, what are we learning about discipleship in this particular story? Go ahead. Make a guess. Right or wrong, he's teaching the disciples in this to go out and feed the people. This is the food, but later on to feed with um, uh, Christ's word, the word of God. Okay. To bring the people in. Okay, so their role, uh, he's kind of helping them understand that they have a particular role of feeding the world. Right. Okay, that's fair. Good. Um, the part that kind of struck me for some reason was how he had them sit down and eat to about 50. I'm trying to think, why would he have them sit down at 50? And I'm thinking, well, <coughs> here there are like 5,000 people or you know, a whole bunch of people. And perhaps the sitting down in smaller groups taught the disciples something about more of fellowship, you know, fellowship with people, maybe not in total in the masses, but maybe in a more intimate fellowship or fellowship where a smaller group that you're possibly ministering in or healing or curing or doing whatever. Okay, so it's promoting small groups. <laughs> small <laughs> See? 50 is a smaller group. <laughs> Did he say I will multiply it? No, but he did. <laughs> but, <laughs> he didn't say it, he did it. Right? He didn't say it, but the implication is that those who have little can entrust that little to the Lord and he will make it plenty. Is that what you mean? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. What else? What else are we learning about discipleship? 
That was it. We all, this yeah. whole side of the room has nothing to say. <laughs> we all are to be disciples. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> oh, okay. Come on. It doesn't say that anywhere in there either. Well, how does, does it? Obvious then? Well, I mean, it's obvious from the context of our faith that we're called to discipleship. But does the story say everyone's a disciple? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> what else would you say about discipleship that comes from this story? Go ahead, Jeff. Make that, a stab. That, that it can be for everyone. That was one of the messages. That it can, that discipleship can be for everyone? Yes. How, so how does this well, story we, put, uh, re relay that to well, us? Where this is taking place, we know that we can presume that many of these 5,000 are Gentiles as well as Jews. You can? Yeah. How, do, how can is you that presume that? What's the name of the town? Bethesda? Bethsaida? Bethsaida. And as I understood it, as we were talking as well, that... So somebody misled you, in other words. <laughs> well, I want to say that. I understood that that, that that area was one that there's, there's Gentiles. So I would presume that, that this huge number of these 5,000, that many of them would be Gentiles. So therefore, discipleship is available to everyone. Yes. Okay. That was, that was the message. That was the message, okay? You agree with that, Dave? Yes, I agree. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sir. <laughs> Jeff. So that very act of service is kind of implanted in this story as an example of what a discipleship is about. A discipleship is about service. He's about, you know, Jesus does. In the Gospel of John, when we hear this story, it's Jesus himself who distributes the loaves and fishes to the people. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three accounts tell us that Jesus gave the stuff to his disciples and he told them to distribute them because um, he needs his disciples to be a, a manifestation of God's graciousness in the world. So they are the ones who hand out the food. What do you have to say here? Anything? Besides, it's all about discipleship. <laughs> So there's a there's an immediate there's an immediate physical need for food and the disciples are asked to meet that need. Um, then the other issue is. The gospel is? And so to me, there, there's got to be a reconciliation because there is a practical piece. We live our lives on a daily basis, yet we're also supposed to look at the big picture of, you know. So, you know, I think, the, I think you make a good point here is that Jesus does not ignore the physical needs of people. And he says that responding to the physical needs of people is critical. So we can't just say to the poor person or the struggling or the hurting person, oh, you know, s stay well and have a good day. We have a responsibility to address their needs. And that's why Jesus says to the disciples, you give them something to eat because it's your responsibility to make sure that the world is fed. So it does have that aspect as well as the spiritual aspect. How are these people being fed spiritually? Yes. Doesn't that in a way speak to what we talk about when we say 
as you go about the day in the world, you should talk to people about God. Because yeah. you're, we are the disciples, and right. we're feeding people. Right. So it, to me, it says, don't stay quiet about God when you have opportunities or when you can make opportunities to speak about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, do so. Okay. Right? That discipleship is a matter of pronouncing the good news or sharing the good news. Bill? To be a disciple, you have to trust in the Lord that you are going to be given what you need to serve the people. When Jesus sent the disciples out with two, two by two, he said, take nothing with you. And they had to trust that the Lord was going to, and Jesus was going to help them profess the truth of Jesus and God, and you will receive what you need. Okay, good, good, yeah. This idea of putting your trust in Jesus as he helps you. You're you're getting uh, and uh, you're getting into the Eucharistic aspect of this, and we'll talk more about that. Mary. Well, I was gonna say that Jesus asked him to do something that was almost ridiculous, mm -hmm. and he gave him somebody's lunch and told him to go feed five thousand people with it. They must have felt ridiculous doing that. And then, and then he leaves him with another problem. What do you do with twelve baskets of leftovers? I thought of that there? too. You know, huh? you're you're an itinerant preacher, and you're traveling with a traveling band. What are you going to do with twelve baskets of leftovers? You know, what? Eat for a month. Eat for a month, but that means that you've got to stay there and be with your food. Try to keep it oh, bread. it's in baskets that they're on their on their back. So you got this all figured out. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so now here's an interesting factor in this story. This story appears um, one, two, three, four, five, six times in the Gospels. So there's the story of the multiplication of loaves and fish. The original story is probably Matthew, uh, Mark, okay? And then it gets kind of repeated. So the original story, if we look at it in terms of Mark's gospel, also already has this Eucharistic fe uh, fe feature to it. But John has the, go John has the story in chapter 6, which is his whole chapter on the Eucharist and body of Christ and things like that. Um, Matthew has the multiplication of loaves for the 5,000 and then across the sea for the 4,000. That's the Gentiles. That's the, the, a little bit of the confusion. So the idea is that this becomes food for the Jews. Jesus crosses the lake and multiplies the loaves and fishes for the Gentiles. That story appears in Mark's gospel, and then, therefore, it appears in Matthew's gospel. So you have those two gospels that have the double multiplication of loaves and fish. And then you have Luke's account. He shrinks it down to one, and John's account has one, multiplication of loaves and fish. They have different... Well, let's put it this way. The author uses them in different ways, okay? That's why I say, you know, Luke's gospel is a gospel of discipleship, and therefore this story now that he has collected from somewhere, from his sources, he has this story. How does he frame it? How does he place it in his narrative? Let's see, I'll put it here because it emphasizes a certain aspect of discipleship. They're getting ready for chapter uh, for 9, verse 51, 
when Jesus places his uh, face toward Jerusalem and then the gospel switches into a, a complete removal from the crowds and a focus on disciples and helping the disciples understand their role in the world. So this is, about, this is approaching that point. So Luke is preparing us as the gospel readers to understand the discipleship aspect that now this story is, is being uh, applied to. But let's look at the Eucharistic aspects of it. First of all, what's it modeled on? What's this whole story modeled on? In the Old Testament. The Exodus. All right. And tell me what happens. Oh, uh, man in the desert. Okay. Um, God feeding his people. Okay. Is there any point in the Old Testament narrative of the Exodus that the people are divided into groups of 50? Hello? Say yes, because <laughs> Say yes. I led you already into that, you know? Yes. And so when Mark has Jesus divide all the people up into groups of 50, and Luke repeats that instruction, we're supposed to remember the feeding of the people in the wilderness and the provisions that God has made for his people. We're supposed to remember the manna. We're supposed to remember the covenants and all God did for his people because now Jesus becomes the living presence of God who provides for his people in the same way that God the Almighty provided for his people in the wilderness, in the desert. So that also connects us with Eucharist because Eucharist is God's provision of the death and resurrection of his son for the life of the world. And so it is food for all of us as we journey forward. So um, again, we're going to uh, look at some of these numbers and kind of uh, wonder What's the relationship between five loaves, 5,000 people, and groups of 50? They all get a tiny portion of fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, the number five is in common, but I don't know what it means. I'm glad you recognize the, the number five is in common, <laughs> but there is no meaning. <laughs> Just seems to be a detail that just kind of end, ended up in the story and we're left with it. Let me ask you this question. Is there any, in this, any, any place in the story that we hear Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes? No. Did you realize that in all four stories, or six stories, in none of them, do we hear that Jesus actually multiplied food? Never says that. It says that they distributed everything to the people and that there was enough and that there was fragments left over. Now, why do all of the headings in our Bibles say the multiplication of the loaves and fishes? Because it doesn't really indicate that. He was he broke the five loaves, the five loaves yeah. and the two fish. He broke them, okay. Just them. And then he gave them out to be distributed, huh. and they were distributed, and there was more than enough. Sounds fishy. <laughs> 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 Can you leave him home next week? <laughs> uh, so Scott asked me, do I, th do I think this story is liter literal or figurative? And I said, I don't know. And he pressed me and he says, well, what's your guess? And I said, well, I guess it's figurative rather than literal. But 
that is not conclusive either. There's no conclusive evidence in either direction um, uh, about the literalness of this story. But you know, when I was younger, much younger, I heard that people made the case that, well, once, once that meager amount of food began to be distributed, then people saw their opportunity to bring out their own that they had been storing and keeping. And so therefore, the miracle is really not that Jesus made many, many fish and many, many loaves, but that somehow people's hearts became open and responded generously to the gospel. Now, for those of us who are steeped in the idea that, no, the miracles are true historical events and we're not going to part from that, feel free. <laughs> I like to think both ways. You know, I like to think that there, there had to be some event that Jesus was responsible for, and it had to be something so astounding that they told a story about it, or that they, they you know, that it, that it appears six times in the Gospels is not just an accident of grace. Oh yeah, people finally opened up their coffers and handed out their food. I think there is something miraculous in this event, and yet I don't know. You know, you see, see where we are. It's it's kind of. I, I think this is for me, anyways. This is an example of I have to trust God. I don't have to figure out how He's going to do it. You know, and in this example, where the fish actually physically multiplied, or did people open up their own bags and start bringing out food? Maybe it was a combination. It doesn't matter. Yeah. God did what he, God does miracles. And God provided for the people there sitting and fed them all. And that's the bottom line. And that's the bottom line. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Linda. Okay, that's beautiful in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you try that after a 40 day fast to see if you feel fulfilled. Yeah. Oh, that was the miracle that they felt full having eaten nothing. <laughs> what about the gospel that says they all ate and were satisfied? <laughs> Maybe we need to <laughs> Bill. I have never heard the concept that Jesus put forth that the people opened up their whatever they had and all started sharing it. And I'm a big believer in the theory and the theology of the Holy Catholic Church. And they were all combined together in believing and sharing what they had. Okay, it's good. I'm not asking for your opinion, by the way. <laughs> so you could, you could just hold on to whatever opinion you have and we'll be fine. Okay. God, yeah. Which yep. is for reports with the service that we should do. That mm -hmm. we always make sure that it points back to God and not about ourselves. And mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Excellent. Anyone else got a thought or a comment? All right, let's dig a little deeper into the text itself and see what we've got. Um, so again, Keep in mind that chapter 9, verse 51, which is coming up, is the pivotal turning point in the gospel. 
where Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem and the whole narrative changes now into the training of the disciples for his ultimate leaving and their ultimate ultimately taking on the responsibilities of the church. So, um, send the crowd away, Jesus, or they say to Jesus, to go into the villages and country around to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a lonely place. That is the Greek word eremos. Do you remember what eremos means? Yes. Desert, wilderness, and what's it supposed to connote? Israel. No, Israel. Israel's sojourn in the desert. So when the Gospels report he went to a lonely place or an Eremos, we're supposed to understand that this is related to God's providential care for his people in the wilderness, in the Eremos of Sinai. Okay? So, it's a lonely place. He says to them, Give them something to eat. All right. So he's immediately encouraging them to participate in this. They are not bystanders. They are to, be, to consider themselves part of this whole measure. Uh, we have nothing. This is, this is repeated in all the Gospels, um, except there is one account in which no fish are mentioned. Um, so... Or it just says a few fish. A few fish, you don't have a number. Uh, so he takes, and here's in, chap, in verse 15 and 16. They all sat down, which is the idea of a banquet, okay? So if they're sitting, the idea is that this is a banquet for God's people. If they were standing, that would be lunch. But they're sitting. And sitting indicates a, a, a rest and a providential care on God's part to feed his people and nourish them well. Okay, so it's a banquet. He took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. This is our Eucharistic connection right here. Okay, is these four verbs. And they are the four verbs that are used for the Last Supper. That's why we know it's Eucharistic in its content, this story. Take, bless, break, and distribute or give away. And they respond, they correspond to exactly what Jesus did at the Last Supper, which corresponds exactly to what he did on the cross. So the celebration of the Eucharist is always about the cross and the meaning of the cross. So in the cross, in Jesus' death, we see that he took his life from God, he received his life and took it, and that means he made it meaningful and purposeful. He wasn't accidentally here, but he embraced, he took, he he uh, um, gathered to himself his life, and he, he was serious and committed to it. He blessed, that is, he, lift, he lifted up his day-to-day -day life to God. He gave God thanks for everything. And this provided you know, him the anchor for his life, the anchor for him to do what he needed to do. He allowed his life to be broken, and broken is, um, you know, a metaphor for opened up, spilled out, given away, okay? So he allowed his life to be broken on the cross for our salvation so that, um, so that this would be distributed and life would be distributed to all God's children. So those four verbs, take, bless, break and give are the symbols of Jesus' own passion and death and giving of himself on the cross. You got that? Okay. So we, we're going to hear these verbs again in all the four Gospels. Um, 
you know, so, so what, they un, what they outline for us is that there is a Eucharistic liturgical practice that is going on at the time that Luke is writing this gospel, around the year 80 to 85, the Eucharistic practice incorporates those four verbs. That is, the liturgy somehow reflects the way that, um, or Luke, in his account, reflects the, the, the way Eucharist was being celebrated in the community around the year 80. Uh, so we hear these verbs, and we are reminded that this is a Eucharistic story. Okay? This part is strange, though, that in, in all of the Gospels, the Gospels are called baskets of garments, but nobody names the names in the Gospel, but none of the Gospel writers names the names. About, about? Or when they were done using the sacrament to justify the Eucharist, but um, they're called... They're they're all, all four Gospels relate to the, the gathering of the fragments. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 what you want? What you want to do, you don't want to go back into a gospel story and figure out all the details, like what happened. No, you just want to take it for what it says. What is it saying when it tells us there were 12 baskets? What does that say? What? Abundance. Anything else? Miraculous abundance. Miraculous abundance, okay. Anything else? Why 12? So why twelve baskets? One for each month. That's really creative. I got that. Why? Huh? Right. But why? No, not the significance of 12. It's because God cares for all his children. It's 12. It's not 11 baskets. It's not, we left the tribe of Reuben over there, and so they're on their own. It's all God's children gathered into this providential um, abundance. Okay? So it wasn't five baskets or eight baskets. It was 12, you know? Because we, because that's the symbol for the whole people. Got it? Yep. Has nothing to do with monks. <laughs> you say that again and you're out. <laughs> all right, they all ate. There it is, Sabina. They all ate. They didn't just pretend. Verse 17, and they took up what was left over, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Okay, so... Does anyone remember the story of Elisha and the barley loaves? Okay, in the, book of, in the second book of Kings, we have a wonderful story about Elisha, who um, is asked to put out, um, or who tells the captain of the guard to put out uh, 10 loaves of barley bread for 100 people. Again, we're talking about little, little date sandwich type bread. And uh, the man says, no, I won't, because that's not enough to feed them. And Elisha says, give the people the bread. And the man gives the, the bread to the people, and they all ate, and they were all satisfied. So we have a precedent to this story in the Old Testament and the providence that God has provided for his people in the prophet Elisha as well. Okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, let's take a short break. Um, get up and wander around and eat some, eat a muffin.
refresh my memory what you said, why the, what's the significance of in Matthew and Mark, and why they told two different versions one for the Jews? Because Luke's gospel is a gospel of inclusivity. He wants to keep everyone together. Whereas Matthew and Mark still have that primitive notion that one is for the chosen people, and yet Christ is for more. But we haven't come to the place where we synthesize the Thank you. Have you ever heard like the C.S. Lewis quote where he talks about how like narrative fiction didn't exist back then? Yeah. Like how the Bible, like he's yeah. a scholar. Of, no, I've never but, heard that. So like C.S. Lewis talks about how like when people say the Bible was made up, he's like that type of writing of like putting in details like a leather pillow over yeah. 5,000 people yeah. he's like that did not exist back then yeah. like like epics back then like yeah. Gilgamesh are, they aren't like nowadays we have detailed when you're writing fiction you put in like details that yeah. make it seem it's like the Bible stands alone. Nothing for fifteen to two thousand years afterwards was ever written in what we would now call like specific narrative fiction. So it's just interesting to me because I, I love what you said about maybe the like, like what you're saying there. But it, it it just when you say like was it real or was it not? Like I I like believing it's both too. But it's just whenever I like see specific numbers or something where it's like Jesus was lying on a leather pillow in a boat. Yeah. Like C.S. Lewis talks about like he's like go try and find any other fiction that was written back then as opposed to just like like bibliography like actual historical events were written that way. But no fiction. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, it's just something that I think about. Know. Yeah. yeah thanks. No, it's special. We're gonna do we're gonna do music. So we have the books out in the back, and so we're gonna have some music from now on. Oh, she does? Oh my Literal. God. Literally. It's amazing. You know, it's an idea. Yeah, I had a very short visit, but it's shocked me. I mean, she is so powerful. She teaches scripture all the time. Yeah. And my husband says, I really try. 
because I am a user of Bible study fellowship. So it's really the only thing yeah. that I had back then. Yeah. You know? And she just took off with that like a rock. But she said it was because she started a divorce support group in Alaska and all these non Catholics showed up. And she was so interested in the scripture study. She thought that was totally lacking in her upbringing. So, anyway, I, when I... Three or something. I love that. Yeah, maybe we can have to live since she's someplace that she lives. She lives in L.A. So oh, okay. So she's driven her dad to six foot of Houston. She taught in L.A. in a Christian school for five years. So she got really used to this, all this technology. So yeah. maybe we could set up like a sure. FaceTime or a sister or whatever. I just thought, it was, oh, wow, what a shame. I couldn't yeah. understand. She couldn't understand. I said, wouldn't that be a connect? That just yeah. almost makes my hair stand up. <laughs> okay, I'll talk about it. All right. Hey, everyone, let's look at uh, Acts of the Apostles. Not Acts of the Apostles. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Chapter 11, one of my favorite passages from St. Paul, 23, verse 23, chapter 11, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the, anyone not there, need, anyone need help? I hear mumbling. What kind of help would you be offering? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're there. You're there? We're there. Okay. All right. Um, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right. First of all, let's put this within a provenance. And, and, uh, Why is this your favorite? I will tell you. <laughs> um, now you threw me. Can you put this in the providence? Why this is your favorite? No, I'm not going to deal with that Can one I now. Can put this in providence? No. Oh, okay. Corinthians, First Corinthians. From St. Paul. It's written somewhere around 51 to 52 AD. Mark's Gospel, the oldest Gospel we have, was written somewhere around 70. What does that tell you about the story of the Eucharist? Or the institution of the Eucharist? It's older than the Gospels. Older than the Gospels. That's really important to recognize, first of all, because Basically, we take our understanding of the Eucharist from the Gospels. And yet there is an older text that tells us something about the Eucharist. What do we hear from, from Paul as he's kind of repeating the instructions that he has received from the Lord? We hear these, this double verb, received and delivered. Do you see that? 
Or do you have that? Yes. I received what I handed out to you. Those are very important verbs because they are a reminder of the rabbinical tradition of receiving and handing on. Receiving and handing on. Because nobody wanted to be responsible for a new theology, it was far more important to relate the tradition and to take what was old, to re, re um, interpret it and give on. And so Paul is saying, I'm following the tradition of our ancestors, which is, this is what I have received and this is what I am handing on. I am faithful to the tradition of our ancestors. I am a good rabbi because this is what I do. Now, do you remember in the gospel readings when people question Jesus and his teaching and they say, what is this? A new teaching. You remember that? They're surprised because it doesn't follow the tradition of the ancestors, which is, this is what I received, this is what I hand on to you. Instead, Jesus offered an entirely new teaching. But Paul wants to be faithful to the tradition, and he wants the Corinthians to understand that he didn't make this stuff up. Somehow it was given to him. Now, the interesting thing is, we don't know how it was given to Paul. Because Paul claims to have had a vision of the Lord Jesus who instructed him in everything. Some kind of metaphysical vision, some kind of encounter with the Lord Jesus who instructed him. Was the Eucharist a part of that? Or was it happening <clears throat> and Paul just moved into a circle of disciples who were already sharing in the Eucharist? We, I'm sorry, where was that? Where was Paul was in Antioch. Is that part of Acts? Yeah, it's in, it's in Acts. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so we don't know if Paul is suggesting, I received this directly from the Lord, and I'm handing it on to you. In other words, I'm fulfilling the tradition of our ancestors, but I'm not taking what else was received from somebody else. I'm taking it directly from the Lord. But it could have been, I'm handing on to you what I myself was given, because we don't have a clear indication of which one it is. But it's hardly likely that Paul had a vision of the Eucharist and just implanted this in Corinth and made it the standard. More likely is the fact that he participated in the Eucharist in Antioch and in other places in Jerusalem and so on and so forth. And he shared in that experience and then this is what he is passing on to them. Now, why is he doing this? then this gets to why this is one of my favorite passages. <laughs> He's doing this because the body of Christ is divided and in conflict with one another. The people of Corinth are at odds with one another. They're judging each other. They're criticizing each other. They're finding fault in each other. And so he says, I'm going to bring you back to why unity and, and uh, um, peace is so important to us because it's rooted in the life of the Lord that he has given to us. So if you would look then at um, verse 28, just go down a couple verses there. Oh no, we can start at 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body 
eats and drinks to his own condemnation or calls judgment upon himself. What does he mean when he says, he who eats and drinks without discerning the body? They haven't had their first communion. <laughs> you and Lee are going to go be assigned at the same table from now on. What does he mean? They don't discern the body. What's the body? Church. The church. What is the problem in this Eucharistic community? They don't like each other. They're at odds with each other. They're, they're, they're arguing with each other. They're leaving people out of the Eucharistic assembly. That's the body. So he's not saying, well, they don't understand the real presence. And if they don't get the real presence, they're eating and drinking condemnation on themselves. No, he's talking about the real presence in the body of Christ gathered to share the bread and the cup. And when we don't recognize the dignity and the beauty of each member of the body, and somehow we hold somebody in contempt or, or uh, kind of outside of the circle of our fellowship, then we have not discerned the body of Christ. We have not recognized the body of Christ. And therefore, we're eating and drinking. We're going to communion and placing judgment on ourselves because we've not done that fundamental act. Does that make sense? That's why I like this so much because it emphasizes the fact that Eucharist isn't a private experience. And we as Catholics have taken it that way. It's me and Jesus. And that's not what Paul wants you to understand. Paul wants you to understand that unless you're looking around and seeing the other members of the body and celebrating with them and recognizing that them that they, did, they too are members of the dignity of Christ, you've just put yourself in hell. You get it? Yeah. So is the key literally meaning what he is saying in on the page one to thirty that so he says for all that's why so many of you are ill and infirm and dying. Yeah. Because they have eaten the bread and drank the cup unworthily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let that be a warning. Okay. Don't want an answer. <laughs> All right. So let's go back a little bit and look at this. Um, so the received and delivered, you see that, and that's the Jewish tradition. Then you have um, the Lord Jesus. He doesn't say Jesus. He says the Lord Jesus. And do you, do you have any guess as to why he uses the title, the Lord Jesus? Because it's a reference to divinity. Okay, to reference divinity and to say that the Eucharist is established in the resurrected Christ. So, you know, this is why when people tell me stories about bloody things and and you know, finding bits of flesh in the Eucharist and things like that, I say, no, the Eucharist is the risen Lord. It's not his physical body. It's not his physical blood. It's the risen Lord that we receive. Does that make sense? And the risen Lord is not a limited creature, limited to flesh and blood. The risen Lord is beyond all that. Okay, um, so the Lord Jesus, on the night he, would, he took bread, all of the traditions uh, that we have in the Bible suggest that the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper took place on the night before Jesus died. So they're all in agreement. Do you realize this? So all five parts. So we've got the four Gospels and then uh, 1 Corinthians. They all agree that the Eucharist was established on the night before Jesus died. Do you realize how significant that is? That it wasn't like something they did occasionally. 
It was something he inaugurated and established on the night before he died to connect it with his death, mm-hmm. you know? Not just a friendly supper. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, in this account, we have, do this in remembrance of me. You have it twice. Do you see that? It's the only account in the Bible that tells us this was repeated twice. So it probably reflects the tradition of the Eucharist that Paul gave to the Corinthians and the tradition of the Eucharist that he received. But you know that in our Eucharist, we follow the Gospel of Matthew, where he says um, he took the cup and said, do this in remembrance of me over the cup and not the bread. Okay? But in this account, we have both. And both is fitting because that's what the phrase means, you know. Now, what does remembrance mean? So it's not just simply memory. We're not just talking about kind of keeping in, keeping in mind. Recommitment. A recommitment to? To, Of our faith. A recommitment to? Jesus' death. Jesus' death. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's saying that, you know, the mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord. Proclaim, remember. Um, these things are all, in a sense... Yeah, but, but what they do is they implicate us in the action so that we are part of that action. So remembrance means to bring the members back together again, to re-piece it and to bring it to God and say, this is who we are, God. Remember, remember that we are your people and that you saved us through the death of your son. So it's, it's not just a reminder to us, it's the people reminding God. And that, that's an ancient Hebrew tradition. Oh God, remember your covenant. I mean, how many times is that said in the Bible? Oh God, remember your people. So we're asking God to remember us. Okay, bring us together and help us to live in the mystery of Christ. Okay, um, the new covenant is different than in Luke's account. Because Luke says, this is the covenant. Now, uh, is it Luke? I don't know. Look it up. Um, One of the Gospels says, this is the covenant in my blood. It doesn't say the new covenant. Because it's related to the fact that God has never made a new covenant. The original covenant has always stood. And... This is just a ratification of that covenant that God has made with his people. That God is for his people, God is with his people, and God saves his people. That's, you know, essentially what all the covenants are about. And so, therefore, this is a covenant in the sense that it's an agreement between God and the people to allow ourselves to be saved through the death of Jesus. It's, it's new in the sense that Jesus brings a whole new dimension to it, but the concept of covenant is not new. All right, and uh, do this as you drink it in mem- remembrance of me. For, often as you, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's a reminder That's why we say the mystery of faith, you know, kind of to conclude the Eucharistic action. We're looking forward to the fullness to be still, um, for us to be gathered in, finally, and until he comes again, until we're gathered in. We will continue to do this thing, that is, live the memory of Jesus Christ until he comes, and then all will be Christ, and Christ will be God's. Okay? All right. Let's take a fast look at um, Genesis.
This is a very bizarre passage. Okay, if you've read it, you might have recognized that. Genesis 14. This would be a great reader for uh, reading for a lector to practice. When Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Chedorar, Leomar, king of El, I mean, it twists anyone up. But we're looking at verse 14. No, what are we looking at? 18. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your foes into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And that's it. So... This is the only time Melchizedek is actually mentioned in the Old Testament. We don't have any indication of where he's from or what he's about. Or He's the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. Okay? So if you hear Salem, Salem is another derivation of the word shalom. So uh, Jeru Salem is Jehu Salem. And Jehusalem is God's name, Yahweh, Yehu, and Salem, the city of peace, or the city of concord. But this is before Jerusalem. Jerusalem does not exist. This is Salem still. Now, Melchizedek is not a Jew. We don't know what nationality he is. We don't know where he comes from. And so the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament takes Melchizedek as a type for Jesus. So Jesus is the high priest like Melchizedek is a high priest. But Melchizedek is a high priest of alien God. And so when he blesses Abraham, he's actually blessing Abraham by the name of another God. So, because God has not revealed his name yet. And so this is El, the God of the Baals. And so Melchizedek probably believed in a panoply of gods. You know? Because that's tradition in the Bible even though it's not the God that we... I mean, it is the God because there's only one God. There's only one God, so it can't be anything else. But for uh, the mind of the primitive, there's a multiplicity of gods. So God uh, basically tells Abram later, Now we have some, someone called Melchizedek telling, uh, blessing a Abram. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making the link. I'm thinking it's very possible Melchizedek was Jesus before he became incarnate. I'm not going to take your, your belief away from you. I think, you know, it could be. Um, because later on, as, as, as the letter to the Hebrews reflects on this role and sees this role very importantly in terms of the Old Testament, you just need to understand that it's very, a very slim account. There's very little in this passage, except that 
We know Melchizedek is some foreign king who has some kind of relationship to a god uh, uh, somehow, and he wants to bless. Why does he want to bless Abraham? Spirit. No, 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 nothing, nothing esoteric like that. Really practical. <laughs> what? Yes, it's his gift to Abram, but why? What? What happened? Abraham. Abram had a victory over the Canaanite kings, so he actually had a victory over five kings, but you'll see four listed. Um, so those kings coalesced in battle against Abram, and Abram was a sojourner in the land. So remember that Abram came down from, uh, Ur, from Haran, and he was wandering in the land of Canaan, and God said, this land I'm giving to you and your descendants. But he, but he ends up just kind of a nomad in this land without any real uh, place of stasis, place that he rests. And so ultimately what happens is his grandson then takes the tribes down to Egypt. And so in that continual wandering, and so that the, to have God establish them in the land is important for, uh, through the Exodus. But at this point, Abram's just a sojourner in the land. He's trying to figure out where God wants him to be. He's got to battle all these kings. And usually the king in these accounts is the mayor of a town. Okay? So, and a town had its own standing group of soldiers and things like that and had an army in name of the, the, the one who ran the town. He called himself a king. But you can imagine, like, Somebody saying, I'm the king of Durango, you know. <laughs> I was just going to mention verse 20. Isn't that the first reference of tithing in the Bible, being that this is in Genesis? Uh, no, it's not the first reference, but it's pretty early. Yeah. yeah. And we'll hear it prescribed later on in, in the book of Deuteronomy. He's got, he's got his own army. Yeah, he's got his own army. He's got an extended family, and he's got his own army. So he's, he's kind of like a nomadic chieftain, if you can imagine that. Um, he takes bread and wine, and we connect that immediately with Jesus in the Eucharist. But in some sense, this is supposed to be these covenantal elements, because God talks about Bread being the staff of life, okay? Bread is what you need to live. Wine is for celebration. So he takes bread and wine, not because he's presaging Jesus, but because these are elements in a covenantal meal. So in a certain sense, he's making a covenant with Abraham. He's saying, chill out, buddy. I know you're a great conqueror, and I don't want to be conquered. So I'm going to honor you and make a covenantal meal with you to signify that we're at peace with each other. Okay? So he's king and high priest of Salem. So he's got to make his peace with Abram. Then how did he deal with Abram saying, well, I don't want someone with a sandwich strap because I believe in the God of Moses High. Because he, 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 he doesn't want to be in a... Uh, a relationship of uh, a beholden relationship to him. He doesn't want to to live in a kind of covenantal relationship with with um, Salem. He wants the freedom from that. So he just lets go. Yeah. Well, he gives him a tenth of his belongings. Yeah, and so and then he moves on. Um, who says I don't want it? Uh, Abram says, uh, I'm not just so much into bread or sandwich strap, I'm anything that is yours, so you cannot say I'm going to give you the bread. Yeah. Nothing so, to me except what my servants have consumed in the spirit of the sweet humanity of 
So he's saying, basically, I'm giving you a tenth. Don't give me anything. Okay? Because I'm not creating a political alliance with you. All right? All right. Go away. <laughs> Go to Mass. Mary, have a great day. Thank you. How could the church I say that at various points, you know, I talk about the communion, that, that communion is not just a thing in our hand, communion is what we are living in. To bring us together because it's pretend to follow one key. Right. Because I think we are we are going to go. Yeah. Right. Except my first communion, I'll never forget that. It was so festive. And this is a